Pentecostal Church. And uh, at present, it's a very well-groomed lot that the gentleman that went the door maintains and has it for a garden and very, very beautiful lot. But uh, that's when they tore the school bus garage down, which yeah. was the old Ford garage. Yeah. I can't tell you the year because I wasn't here at the time that they tore it, it down. Early 90s, probably. I remember too, but I don't know. I remember it happening. I don't know what year it was. Um, uh, and so now, uh, since you you came lived here, since when you retired, you moved back up here. Right. When I retired in '93, 1993, I, I moved back up here, and uh, uh, my wife passed away in 2003, and I moved into the Village Place condos here in '94, uh, 1994. Golly, I've been here since. Uh, been here quite a few years. No, my wife died in 2003, so I moved in the village condos here in 2004. Oh, eight and, uh, years already. Yeah, eight years. Yeah. Hard to believe that time flies that fast. Uh, I know, it's terrible. Uh, you said Charlie Pappen first built a house for you? Yes, the one that was out uh, uh, just a little ways. Because uh, you built the first one. You built it yourself, you said. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't build it. Charlie Pappen built it for me. I wish that... Oh, the, uh, the one you sold to Mahoney? Right, right. Charlie Pappen built the house. Oh, okay. oh, I had the, uh, bought the acreage and uh, had the house built. And very nice, uh, comfortable little home. It wasn't very big, but I had done a garage and it was very nice. The one out by the lake? The one out by, uh, no, the one, the one out by the lake uh, uh, was my father and mother-in-law's house. And my brother-in-law's bought it from them. And they wanted to build a new home because they adopted what would have probably been a third or fourth uh, cousin that needed a home when he was about age five, six, and uh, thereabouts. So I said to my wife, we were in car, I said, why don't we go back up to Oscar and buy your brother's house? She beat me out to the car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, uh, so we moved back to Oscar in uh, 1993. And uh, one thing I do have a little regret about is I was extremely active in Clare. I was the mayor and on the city commission in Clare. And, uh, very, very active in Rotary. is the only two-time president of the Qantas, excuse me, I said Rotary, of the Qantas Club that they ever had, and active in the Knights of Columbus and everything. And when I walked down the street, people crossed the street because I used that four or five different tickets for things that I was selling. Uh, and that, But I said to my wife when we moved back to Roscommon that I wasn't going to be that active. We were going to have a little bit of time for ourselves to take rides and a vacation and things of that nature. And that's what I did. I'm not active. Uh, uh, basically in the communion in the community at all anymore I don't belong to the rotary or uh, any organization such as that uh, uh, when I was in Clare I was president of the Michigan vocational guidance directors Association Michigan counselors Association and uh, on the Chamber of Commerce and everything and sometimes uh, <laughs> you meet yourself going back to where you just came home from <laughs> and that uh, so I, I said when I moved back up here and we retired uh, that uh, we would have a little time for ourselves and yeah. I pretty much followed that yeah. and I wish that I didn't do it to that extent, but, you know. Right. Um, but you have a group of gentlemen that have coffee together or something that you right. talk about in old times. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I, nice. have, uh, I have coffee every day with uh, friends. We meet out at the TP between 9 and 10. And three of the people that are there are former students. Uh, uh, and that really? Lyle, Lyle Mead, Vern, uh, Vern Myers, uh, Dave Doherty, and a couple other real good friends. We lost a couple people had coffee with us that passed away that... Uh, it's very, very sad, yeah. uh, and that's what happens, you know, uh, you start losing people that have been good friends for years, and they pass sure. away, and sure. your group gets smaller and smaller, yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, but we talk about things that happen, uh, uh, Vern raises pigeons, and uh, he was on a basketball team here, and of course I knew all the kids that uh, played basketball with, as with Lyle, who played basketball with Dave Doherty, Dave uh, is on the Kirtland School Board, and he uh, attends every basketball game for both the boys and the girls out at Kirtland. Oh, yeah. He loves basketball. He was a great ball player himself, and so he loves basketball. Firebirds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're called he Firebirds, I think. Yeah, right. So he goes to all of them. And I play poker with uh, a group Gregory. We're in uh, a quiet stage right now. I'm not playing because we lost a couple of the fellas uh, to death, uh, and so we aren't playing at the present time. But if we pick up another member or two, we'll restart the poker group. Um, when I played, <laughs> this is interesting, maybe you might be interested in, uh, in that. Uh, we had a poker game going on, which was the apartment up above what is now the wine shop in the old Warren Dunham building. That's what you, that's the building I wanted to okay. tell me about. Right, okay. Okay, this is the story. Good. Right. A uh, nice gentleman by the name of Warren Dunham had a uh, meat market and grocery store downstairs, which is the building now, which is the wine shop uh, uh, in the old Warren Dunham building. Warren built that uh, building, and there was a nice apartment you up, know how long upstairs. Ago no, uh, well, I came here in the fall of 52, and it was up already, and he had his business running. My first year here, I worked for him uh, as a meat cutter in the meat department, and the lady that taught me was a wonderful, wonderful lady who passed away right now. Her name was Dorothy Richardson, and her two sons have a uh, uh, roofing business here in the area. But uh, Dorothy was a wonderful, wonderful woman, and small, slight lady, but 
against you could twist a quarter of beef on her shoulder and put it on a chopping block and, okay. and we cut it up into steaks and everything such wow. as that. Dorothy her, Richardson. Dorothy Richardson. I had her daughter in school and her daughter and all, a uh, married gentleman by the name of Jack Mower, and she owns the newspaper in Clare. Oh. And she's the editor and owns the newspaper in Clare. And she's an assistant to the two Richardson boys that are really active in the Masons here and have a roofing uh, business. So that's Randy and what's the other one? Uh, I thought it was Jack, but I might be wrong. Oh, okay. and that, uh, but uh, but anyway, okay, back getting, to back, to the, getting back to this building, I got to tell you this, this was fun. I had the opportunity of joining a group that played poker up above Dunham's store. And the gentleman that lived in the apartment uh, and that was by the name of Dolnick. And he was a good poker player, but he also was the justice of the peace. And a couple of fellows that I played poker with are gone right now, uh, but were great guys. Uh, Bob Phillips, uh, Red Murphy. Uh, I'll think of the others as we go along. Okay. But there we'd be playing poker. There we'd be playing poker. And uh, since he was the justice of the peace, why the state police pick up a violator and they would bring him up to the poker game. And so <laughs> Sammy Galnick uh, would excuse himself to the living room, take care of the case, come back and play poker, and a state police would come and kibitz the poker game. <laughs> oh, sure. How fun. What a fun. But it, it was fun. It was really interesting in that. Now, Sammy was crippled. He had a very bad back and uh, that. But he was a graduate druggist from Ferris, but he didn't get his license because he wasn't able to do the physical things that working in a uh, drugstore entail. But oh. he was very, very intelligent, and uh, consequently, a lot of people, when they needed a salve mixed or wanted some knowledge about a drug that would be good for a cold or that, they would go consult with Sammy, and Sammy would be able to tell them what to go to the drugstore and ask the druggist uh, for help and whatever they particularly oh. needed. And he uh, lived in that apartment? He lived in that apartment till he died. He died after I left uh, Ross Commons, so I can't tell you what year it was that he uh, passed was away. Was he a single man? He was a single man, right. He still has uh, relatives in the uh, area, uh, but I don't know how distant they are uh, from him. But uh, uh, Lauren, who owned the building and rented the apartment to Sammy, didn't play poker. <laughs> oh, Lauren didn't no, play? No, Lauren didn't play, Lauren didn't play in the game. Uh, Bob McGinnis, who has passed away now at the present time, uh, that has uh, gone. Um, <laughs> So most of the most of the fellows that played there uh, at the time I did uh, have gone. Was that a weekend thing? It was every Monday night. Oh, every Monday night. Every Monday night, uh, and that was it was a lot of fun. Then of course I got involved in a poker group. That's my passion. Used to be my passion playing poker. Uh, Wednesday night with the group, and uh, we used to uh, go out to Frank Rulo's place out uh, in Keno and play poker there. Frank and who? Frank Rulo. Rulo. R O U L O. Frank used to, at one time he was a state policeman, and one time he owned a grocery store on West Side Higgins Lake. And his wife taught the third grade here in Ross Common. Wonderful lady, Charlotte Rulo. Well, Frank owned Snelly's Dog Food in Bay City for a long time. Then he got involved into real estate and had a real estate office in uh, Grand Blanc. Uh, and then, of course, he passed away at the present time. And then I had bought a little building from uh, Mary Lockery. It's right on Lancewood Drive, and it is located on the river, Osabo River. I bought a little building belonged to Mary and her husband, and uh, I converted it into a poker room, and for a couple of years, in warm weather, we played poker out in my little cabin. I put a little sign on front that said, Hi, Lopa, because <laughs> we played high-low poker. Well, how far is that? How far out Lancewood is it? Uh, well, right now it would be right across where uh, um, Mel McCutcheon lives, oh. out on the river. So is it still there? Uh, no, the building isn't there. Who's the gentleman that's a conservation man, retired, that uh, he lives there in a the house right on that uh, piece of property. Very active. His wife is very active in the community. Oh, Gary Michelle. Yeah, Gary Michelle has a new house that's on that uh, particular piece of property. Oh, that's where you were, right there on right. the right. Before I came to the condo here, I went and saw him and told him that I owned that uh, piece of property and that he has his house on it. If he wanted to sell it, uh, I'd be interested in buying it from him because it had been my property. And then I added a uh, little piece on it. I 212 feet of frontage on the Osabo. There where my little cabin was. So uh, did you tear the cabin down? Who tore it down? Uh, a gentleman bought it by the name of John Servant, not Shervin. Uh, but his name was Servant. I never met the gentleman. When I left here to go to Central Michigan University, my brother-in-law, Bill, bought it. Bill and Fisher. Bill Fisher, about. right. Uh, he bought it, and then later on, uh, this gentleman, Mr. Servant, wanted to buy it, and Bill sold it to him. Uh, Mr. White, for the paper, for the rest of the paper. Yeah, sir. Oh, okay. Now we have our recording. Jeannie Carlson, J-E-A-N-N-E, who has entered the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I can't remember, I'll ask Jeannie. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, that's interesting. That's very interesting. How long did you do that? The whole 10 years you were here, pretty much? Uh, 
Oh, I didn't buy that building until I <laughs> saved up a little money. I bought the building probably in 55 until, uh, oh, probably 62. Who did you buy it from, do you remember? I bought it from Mary Lockery. Oh, yeah, you said I bought it from Mary Lockery. Lockery. Your father had built it. Oh, her, John had built it. Her father had built oh, her, it. her father was. Her father, Mary Lockery, had built it. Was a Walker. Right, and a wonderful fireplace in it and uh, that. I got to tell you something interesting in that. Uh, one night it was broken into and uh, nothing was stolen. But it was a bunch of kids from school and so they stacked up all their beer cans that they drank and so forth in a couple of pyramids on the counter and because they were very nice and uh, they didn't break anything of that, they left me a six pack for myself for the use of the room. <laughs> for God's sake. <laughs> now that, that is really something. Yeah, right. Uh, I don't know who did it. I could guess, but I, I won't do that. They never told you? Uh, no, they, they never told me. I never did have a name and two broke in. Uh, and I had to break one window to, to get in. Uh, and that, but that well, you knew all the kids at school by then. Oh, yeah. I used to so pride you had a good idea. I, yeah. I used to pride myself when I got here, because after three days, I knew the name of every kid in all my classes, what the names of their parents were, and that and that type of thing held, even when I did the uh, taught classes at Central. After the third meeting, I knew the name of every person that I had in class, what town they were from, and whether they were married. But I wish my memory were like that now, but it isn't. But I did. I, I, people used to marvel that I could remember names uh, like that. I knew the names of the brothers and sisters of every kid that I had in school in Ross Drama, the names of their parents. And part of the thing that I did here, too, I was the bus supervisor uh, wow. when I was here. And so I planned the routes and uh, everything such as that, the care bills yeah. and all the other things uh, such as that. And so consequently, I, I knew where the kids went. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think that when you are a teacher, you should have an idea where all your children live. And when I went to Claire as the guidance director, I was able to persuade the superintendent that on indoctrination day, the first day of school or so, that we take a bus and introduce the, all the new school personnel where the school district boundaries were and an idea where kids live. And it gives you a little different perspective on your children yeah, and sure. everything such as that. For example, I don't mean to belittle anybody or anything, but you get to a home where it is one and a half rooms with an outside toilet and the kid is struggling in school and having a difficult time and your first reaction if he misbehaves is to probably punish him. Well, if you know the conditions that he lives in and what a time he is having even getting to school, yep. it's different. Yep, we'll get it different. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Great. We had a Did you do that bus work? Uh, was that part of your regular salary? Did you get paid extra for that? I got paid extra for that. Yeah, I got paid extra for doing the bus work. Wow. I do that after school. And, uh, How many buses did they have back then? At that point in time, uh, we had eight regular routes and two kindergarten routes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I used to drive the bus to go to, uh, I drive the spectator bus to go to the ball games. Uh, and I'd have a little kid go to the ball games. And I substituted on the roads. So I knew every road where every kid lived that was on a bus route at that particular time. I can tell you this, the only deer that ever hit my life was on a school bus road. It was on Art O'Connor's road, which went way the devil out on McMaster's Bridge Road. and then wound up so the youngsters that were there, the name escapes me right at the present time, two of the youngsters, one in first grade and one in uh, kindergarten. And that uh, uh, when they came to school, I was picking them up at 6 in the morning to get them into school. And they were the first ones on the bus and the last ones delivered at nighttime. So when those poor little buggers fell asleep in class, you can understand it. Uh, they came to school. They came to school so early. Yeah. And they were little kids. Tubbs was the last name. Uh, and that uh, they were probably closer to my own than they were to us. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that at the time. But anyway, I was going out there with the empty bus to pick up the Tubbs children. And five deer came across in front of me as I was going downhill. I was able to swerve, which I shouldn't have done, but I did swerve. And if one deer did fall down, I would have missed them all, but one deer fell down coming down, and I broke his hip. And so I stopped the bus, and I went and picked him up and put him on the floor of the bus. And that, of course, oh. being very naive, I thought, well, I could take him over to DNR and they could uh, splint his leg. Well, you can't do that with a wild animal. But anyway, the kids all hopped on the bus, and they pet the deer as uh, they would come in and take their seats and everything like that. Well, I took the deer over to the DNR, the regional office and that, and I thought, well, you know, they might be able to splint the deer up and everything like that, maybe have him in a pen until they like you, but sadly that night they shot him. Uh, and that, uh, but that's, that's I'm my... I'm surprised he laid still in the bed, well, in the bus. Well, of course, with the back hip broken, he, he, couldn't, do he much. couldn't do much, you know, and everything oh, like that. Oh, couldn't give it to the family, he could have it for different. Well, of course, I thought that it could be salvaged. Yeah. And, uh, that, so, but it couldn't. The only deer I ever hit in my life. That's pretty that, awesome uh, for yeah. as much as you've lived up here. Yeah, right, uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> the kids great. really got a big kick out of it. Oddly enough, that was, uh, during hunting season, too. That's why I used to get teased about that. So, well, why didn't you kill it? It was hunting season. You could have had the meat. <laughs> Did you fish or hunt when you're up here? I hunted when I first uh, came, and that, but I don't like kill animals. I don't kill anything. The only reason I went hunting was to go with the guys at the uh, poker group 
and that's where we could play poker. Al Sherman was the other poker player, and uh, I used to come up and go to his cottage over on Lake Marguerite. And interesting about coming up for hunting season for a couple days, I go hunting, is everybody considered themselves a master cook, and they all wanted to be the cook, and so they tried to outfly each other uh, on the meal that they prepared. Now, El, uh, not Elwood, but Daryl Matheson and Dole Figley uh, hunted, but they also used to gather turtles all year. And then they'd have a couple big meals and, and they'd cook at hunting group. And that, so the meals were positively fantastic. Uh, and that, cause so they all wanted to... You only went as far as Lake Marguerite to do this? I went to Lake Marguerite and Elves when I came up from Clare to go uh, uh, hunting out there. And uh, that, and like I say, I, I came up for the food and played poker. Sure. Uh, I didn't care for the hunting. Sounds I, like did, a good I did go out and uh, that and stood in a spot and that, took a nap under a tree. Uh, I really wasn't interested in killing anything, so no. I'm not a hunter. And you didn't fish either? Well, yeah, I did fishing, but nothing like a skilled fisherman. I just get my little boat and put the anchor down and throw it away, and I'd have my dog in the fishing boat, and uh, that, and the dog would go swim, and I'd have to haul him up into the boat, and <laughs> it was fun. Did you fish at Higgins Moss Lake? Higgins Lake, right, Higgins Lake, yeah. Well, I fished outside my little cottage there on the Asabo, too. Oh, sure. I'd catch a couple of little Did pieces. you stay there, like, for the summer in that little cabin? No, never stayed, uh, never. Oh. I never spent the night there except the opening day of fishing season. That's the only time I ever spent any time there. How little was it? One big room. One big room. One big room. We had a counter with the little kitchen area and with the stove there, and then the living room wasn't too big, and uh, that, and uh, with a table, and there was no sleeping arrangement there, uh, and that I had to put a chair out there, you could sleep in a chair. But it was basically unfurnished when I bought it. I left it that way, except for the poker table and chairs. Right. Uh, and and then, uh, there was no bathroom then? No, there was no bathroom, no. Uh, at 212 feet on the, on the river? Well, it wasn't originally 212 feet, it was about 150, but I bought a portion of the land that uh, belonged to, uh, I'm trying to think of what his last name is. I can't uh, think of the fellow I bought 50 feet from Dan on. It squared him up, and oh. it gave me a little bit of a square property, too. More square, because it was pretty much on the road, and yeah. most of your frontage was on the river. Nice. That's and a nice spot on the river. It was a nice, uh, nice yeah. piece of property. I always kidded my brother-in-law. I said he, be, he became on his way to becoming a millionaire by buying that piece of property from me. <laughs> Bill Fisher? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more. Uh, I want to ask about who you taught with those 10 years that you were here. Who some the other teachers, teachers that were here? Yeah. Well, some of the other teachers were here were a nice gentleman from out in Boston, was here the first five years I was, Tony DeLuna, my good buddy Clyde Schultz, uh, uh, who persuaded me to come here, uh, and that taught here, and he spent his entire teaching career yeah. in the community. And that, see, Clyde, when Clyde and I graduated, you couldn't find a teaching job. We were young veterans, and all kinds of veterans were graduating at that time, in 1950. And so Clyde couldn't find a teaching job. I was lucky because uh, I found a job in social work, and uh, Clyde went back to work in the mines. Oh, did he? And he worked in the mines his first two years out of college until this job came up in Roscommon where he could teach Spanish. Then he called me and I came up and uh, uh, taught too. And I made my teaching certificate good. And good I'm glad I did because I met my wife here. We married at sure. St. Michael's and it worked out extremely well for me. Uh, really good experiences. I got my real estate license, made a lot of friends, indulged my passion of playing poker a couple times a week. <laughs> and <laughs> What was that, uh, that name of the gentleman from Boston? Tony DeMuna. Tony DeLuna, he, he, uh, D-I-L-U-N-A, and oh. Tony taught uh, math. Very well liked and very uh, very fine uh, math teacher. Okay, some of the Who other... was the principal when you were teaching? Well, Earl Haight was the principal when I came here, uh, and that, but uh, actually speaking, uh, uh, the superintendent, uh, Mr. Hulse, uh, kept his hands, and basically speaking, he was the principal and the superintendent uh, on it. Uh, Earl did the attendance and a couple other things, but he was busy with all the sports, and so Hulse but, actually acted as the principal and took care of the discipline, too. Uh, oh, really? So Mr. Yes, Haight was more the athletic director? Uh, yes, he took care Tenders. of the athletics and the personal coaching. And let's see, who else was teaching at the time? Uh, Ralph Ostling came at the same time I did and taught uh, shop and drafting and uh, did a very fine job. And he retired uh, from teaching after I left, and then he went on to become a state representative. And uh, that I served on the township board out in Garris Township with, uh, with Ralph. I was a trustee, and Ralph was the uh, township clerk. And Ralph was very, very efficient. In fact, I always used to say with Ralph, that when he was building a house or putting a foundation or anything in the way of house construction, he could have set up bleachers, he could have sold tickets to watch him work. He was so fast and so efficient that you would have paid to watch him work. No That's pay. how good he was. I'll tell Thela. So good, yeah. Uh, well, I told Thela, Thela knows yeah. that. Uh, yeah, see, wow, he, was, he was a tremendous worker. Anybody that had work done by Ralph uh, had it done by a, a sir professional that uh, uh, really took pains to make sure everything was right. I would have paid admission to sit the bleachers to watch him work. Uh, <laughs> He was really, really good. Yeah. Uh, we had a nice art teacher, uh, Joe Bagan, for a couple years. The 
first art teacher when I first came here was called Art Taney, and he was a, uh, but he was a very, very good art teacher, and he taught kids different things that most art teachers uh, don't teach, and uh, like but he only stayed one year. Oh. Well, he, he, uh, at that time, he's introduction to pottery, oh. uh, and that, and he taught uh, a little bit about fine art history with the different uh, types of painters that they were at that point in time, and of course, then you do the traditional things with the kids, but, yeah. uh, but he did a uh, few of the other things, and let's see who else was there. Mrs. Bird, Joanna Ray was the English teacher uh, at that time, very fine, fine lady. Um, science, Earl taught, uh, Earl Hay taught the science class, and that, uh, the business teachers uh, varied, but for the last couple of years that I was here, uh, B. Cornell was the business teacher, and she lived oh in Grayling. Her husband had an insurance and real estate business in Grayling, had been a former coach at Grayling High School. Very, very fine lady. Um, see, that's about all I can remember. Oh, Jim Mahoney was the vocal music teacher, and the band uh, uh, teachers very Ernie Potts was a band teacher when I first came here, and Henry Verbergermost uh, uh, then came in the last three or four years that I was here. He was the band teacher. Uh, he went on to become the superintendent of schools up in the little town of Lake Lemon, which is just three miles from right. my hometown. Yeah, 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 that's right. Just three miles from Florida. Well, that's pretty good. You think we've covered most of, of your... Well, I can tell you anecdotes on just about anything, but uh, you, you'd have to ask me the questions because I can't think of what I would like to uh, like to say. Oh, full, no, I had great You're full of good stories. Pardon? You're full of good stories. <laughs> Where did the Rotary meet when you were... The Rotary met at the Colonial, and oh. uh, the lady that had the uh, Colonial uh, bar was passed away, and it was Jeannie's ex-husband, Mary Green, ran the oh. Colonial Bar. And the lady that ran the Colonial Restaurant when I was here uh, was named Alta Frank, and her son lives just a short distance from me, Bill Frank. And she ran a real nice restaurant with good meals and everything. And Mary, who ran the Colonial Hotel Bar, uh, who Woody Lockery owned it, but she ran it for him, uh, and that ran a very nice, efficient bar. They did dancing there every Friday and Saturday night. And uh, uh, that I got to tell you this anecdote. This is a very pleasant one, but I got to tell you. Uh, I came up one time to visit my in-laws, and I went to a coin show with Eddie Sherman. And we went down to Bay City, and on the way home, I said, uh, well, let's stop at the Cedar Inn in St. Helen and uh, have a couple beers. So we did. Well, Eddie didn't drink, but I had a couple beers in my car. It was like home, home, home week. I hit the Cedar Inn, and all the kids that I had in school at one time or another, drinks were coming so fast and furious. So anyway, <laughs> we, we had to leave. So this was on a Saturday night. So then we came to the Colonial. And I said, well, Eddie, we've got to have one more for the road. That was a mistake. And so we went into the Colonial, and the same thing happened. This was probably one of the two times in my life that I ever had too much to drink and got drunk. Uh, and that. <laughs> so I got I got back to the house, you know, with my in-laws and everything like that. And my poor mother-in-law commiserated and said, oh, my poor daughter, my poor daughter. She married a heavy drinker. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I'll never forget that night. And that, well, that's where everybody in Oscala went for dancing, you know. Well, sure. All the kids at that time had reached the age of 21, you know, that I had in school. And, uh, sure. So, they were so all this was after, after you, you were just up here visiting. I was just up here visiting, right. Or, so. I was just up here visiting, yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> uh, at, uh, Great. Uh, well, I think we did pretty good. I think we covered most everything. Well, unless there's anything specifically that you can uh, well, uh, think of. Well, I mostly wanted uh, to tell us about the postcards and all that, so I think we did all right. Uh, I used to take the kids when they thought driver in the summertime. Uh, Mr. Pappenfuss was very good. He let me use his... Uh, cottage grounds out on Higgins Lake, and so every kid that I had in driver ed uh, and that got to go swimming out at the Pap Pappenfuss Cottage at summertime, because he allowed me to use the grounds and that, and Jimmy Papp, uh, who was a fine basketball player, a wonderful kid, he retired from teaching out at Tawas, and uh, that taught me how to water ski, and uh, the one thing I was proud of, there was only one youngster that I had missed in Roscommon that I taught driver ed in in nine years that uh, missed night driving, but I took every kid that I ever taught, always had experience in night driving, Great. and uh, that... Uh, we drive to the ball games. You don't take four or five kids in the drive that car. Drive to the ball games. Eat out supper at you know whatever town we're in at some restaurant in that town, and uh, uh, it was a good experience. Where was Pappenfuss Cottage at the lake? Uh, Pappenfuss Cottage was uh, just a little bit to the north of Flag Point. Oh. Uh, on Pine Bluffs. On Pine Bluffs, right? Exactly that subdivision, Pine Bluffs. Yeah, very very nice. And that, yeah. All right, since we're on that, I I'll keep going on Pine Bluffs. May right. had a uh, uh, friend that had a listing, uh, didn't, it wasn't a formal listing again, like with me, everything was a handshake, and she had a nice cottage, it was 100 feet of frontage for $16,000, that'd be half a million dollars now, but anyway, uh, she told me about it. I took a gentleman that owned a Ford garage in Flint out to see it, and he was Lebanese, and he was a little bit dark, and uh, his wife was a little bit dark complexioned, and uh, had a couple of beautiful little children, you know, that were dark complexioned. Well, the lady's brother, that owned a particular cottage was there, and he was the most impolite person that you ever saw in your life when I showed it. 
And so the gentleman said to me, he said, Larry, he said, I have never been treated so rudely by anybody in my life. He said, you aren't treating me rudely. You're, you're trying to overcome that guy. Uh, and he was the owner or the neighbor? No, he was a brother to the lady that owned it. Oh, the brother to the lady? Brother to the lady that owned it. And whatever his reason was, well, it came out later. Well, anyway, he complained to May Malone. His sister complained to May Malone and said, your salesman showed it to a Jewish family. Now, Jewish families are not allowed to buy property on Higgins Lake. Therefore, you cannot show my property anymore. Well, needless to say, I lost the friend. The gentleman was very nice, and he went and bought a place on the west side of the lake. So we lost the listing, even though it was only a verbal listing, and we lost the sale because the people interpreted that he was Jewish and that he wasn't. He was Lebanese. I won't mention his name because... Uh, the family name is still operating, and they might own the place in, on the other side of Higgins Lake, although that was before, that was in the 50s, so you know, that's a long time ago. But uh, they only had deep restrictions on uh, property on Higgins Lake that you couldn't sell the blacks or you couldn't sell the Jewish people. It's, if, you look in, if you look at an old deed uh, out there, you'll find that that's right in it. No kidding. It's right, in, uh, right on the papers. It's illegal, of course, but it was still in writing on the old deeds that you couldn't sell. Joe Lewis tried to buy a place on Higgins Lake and uh, wasn't allowed, nobody was allowed to sell it to Joe Lewis. No kidding. And that, uh, Never heard that before, Larry. That's a good story. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very, that's very, very true. Uh, I don't know what area on this side of the lake that uh, Joel who was wanted uh, was interested in buying, but they could not sell to. Uh, and, and that uh, no, couldn't sell. But uh, but on the old deeds or the old abstracts and that, if you go and look at a couple, you'll still find that clause in there uh, that you weren't able to sell to Jewish people or you weren't able to sell to blacks on Higgins Lake. Okay. Gee, I've never heard that before. That's terrible. Well, even to this day, I don't know if you will find. Uh, very many blacks. I know that there'd be a handful of blacks on Higgins Lake. I'm you I'm might sure find people of the Jewish faith on Higgins Lake. Uh, sure and that, but at that time, uh, you couldn't. And uh, it was sad, uh, and that because uh, I would have sold the property in the morning. I don't care about that. But I would have sold it to the gentleman had he been uh, uh, just polite. The house would have sold. Uh, and that, and of course, would have been a month's salary. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, more than a month's salary, actually. Great, speaking yeah. as a commission, yeah. and that. But uh, a lot of crazy little incidents, but some incidents involved people and so maybe we better not. Right. Okay. Uh, that. Well, you've done very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's nice that you were able to come back and you are so involved in the his history of the local area. So, well, any more things you want to tell us? Cool. Cool. Think cool. About cool. I'm very, know. very happy. My wife died in, uh, as I say, in 2003 and we had good, 10 good years after we came back to uh, Roscommon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you can't beat that. There are no. two brothers with here. Uh, yet Jim, uh, my brother-in-law Jim, uh, retired from teaching here in uh, Roscommon. The first year of teaching here, he stayed with Claire and I. Oh, he lived with us for the first year. And uh, Bill enjoyed it here. He retired. I sold Bill a lot of property. It's just a crazy little aside and everything such as that. Bill bought a lot of property for me, and I uh, got him involved in a couple pieces of property and uh, that. And so he did extremely well on him. Uh, and that, so I like to kill him about that. Of course, I can't kill him now. Bill, but, uh, yeah. uh, too bad, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, I think that we did well. I think, well, I hope I we think did. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope it's all on here. Well, hour and 20 minutes. So, um, thank you very kindly. And the Starbucks Society thanks you. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you.